Hey there, everyone. Welcome back. All of Fabric 6 Kimballs. Annoying creepers. <laughs> These guys are not my friends. I have no idea why they keep spawning in everywhere. I mean, I do have an idea. They're, they must be classified as passive mobs. They always just happen to be in the wrong place at the, at the right time. The right? The wrong place at the wrong time, for me anyway. All right, so you would have seen that we have a roof on this thing. A roof that we can somehow get in and out of with a handy little shortcut. I bet you thought I forgot about the behemoth. Yeah, the factory is coming along pretty nice, and I'm pretty happy with how this place is turning out. Thank you, girl. Don't know when I'll see you next. Now, where we're at with modern industrialization is remember last time I got a little bit too enthusiastic and thought I could leapfrog, pardon the pun just get straight into assembly machines and automating uh, drill delivery back to our quarries there behind me. But then I saw this description here for analog circuits. But basically it says that you automate machine hulls, analog circuits, motors, pistons, rubber arms, and conveyor belts using assemblers as soon as possible. That way you'll get electric machines for basically free. So that would be machine hulls. I'll just bookmark all these. Analog circuits, motors. So that is basically these things here. They're not easy crafts. It must be said that I don't really know what I'm doing. Ooh, new moon. But I know like to get further down the line here in MI, you really should try to make production line and passive automation for everything before it. And to get all these things automated that it suggested, like the redstone battery, it will favorite that. The redstone battery kind of means you want to have tin cables automated and battery alloy plates. We'll chuck them in the shopping list. The analog circuit requires resistors, up a wire, inductors, capacitors, oh my god, analog circuit boards. But this one requires rubber. You can see this is getting more and more complicated. You get rubber, you mix either synthetic oil or synthetic rubber with a bit of paper. But yeah, at least in my mind, that's MI in a nutshell. Have a look what you want to build, know what it takes to, to put that together, and then make a bit of a shopping list, and then just put in the busy work of actually building that stuff. And I think just to make sure that we're not going to run out of resources here, put like just a small amount of rods and rings and stuff like that. That should start trickling in. And that'll just give us a bit more of a buffer of things to play with. I don't want to spend too long over here at the MI factory today because I have plans to do a bit of automation in Batania and that'll take a bit of time. So we'll skip through this and jump to that. Unfortunately, it seems that you can't build on top of this catwalk stuff because it's half a slab down, which is possibly the worst thing in the world because it looks so gorgeous. It would have been so nice. But oh well, back to acacia slabs. We can always change things out later on. Let's just do a little bit of this together. We need to make rubber sheets. Rubber sheets, you mix in either synthetic oil or synthetic rubber with paper. You get a much better ratio with the synthetic rubber, so we'll go for that one. That's mixing in sulfur with synthetic oil. So we've got sulfur coming in down here from our macerating of, of lignite coal. And that's with synthetic oil. Synthetic oil you get from SBFing up raw synthetic oil, and that's just mixing water and coke. And that has only one use, which is to put it into an SBF to refine it. This might be a bit of a hack job because this thing requires steam for now, but eventually we're gonna upgrade it to electric, but we can worry about that later. So you've got steam coming in. You're going to make us raw synthetic oil. You are also going to need uh, coke dust coming in. And funnily enough, also water. These item pipes, you can have kind of any, in fact, literally all the items now are currently sharing this one item pipe, but you can't mix fluids. They need their own special pipes. I'm going to keep them color coded. I'm going to output water from our granny sink. That's making us raw synthetic oil. We'll give that its own color as well. So that is going to go into there. Let's put a tank there and auto extract that into the tank. Synthetic oil literally has no other uses. I mean, I mean I'm not that interested in dye duping at the moment. So it literally has no other uses but to make synthetic rubber. So I'm not going to have a long pipe network of it. Instead, we'll just make the synthetic rubber on site and we'll just be bringing in the sulfur dust. into here, got synthetic oil coming in, lock that recipe, 
let in the sulfur, give it the steam, and that'll convert one bucket of synthetic oil into a bucket of synthetic rubber. Eventually, it's all getting a bit messy, but I might just store that, let that accumulate in this tank. We mix that with paper to get rubber sheets. It's a bit of a grind, so probably not the best viewing for YouTube. So I'll do all this in the background and then we can have a chat when that's all done. And with them we can make analog circuits to officially enter the, the electric age. And that's just one more piece in the puzzle to make an assembler. And they're the machines that put things together for us with just a little bit of electricity. So I'm going to be on a bit of a loop doing that same kind of process, setting up the required ingredients for all the things that make up an assembler, plugging in their kind of basic units, outputting them to spaces here, um, manually crafting them for the time being, unfortunately. But once we have enough assemblers, we'll, we'll get me out of the mix and we'll have the machines building their own parts. Wish me luck. Lessons learned, you probably shouldn't rely on such small numbers of these items. Like in hindsight, I probably should have thrown down a few MI barrels for things like copper wires, rubber, tin wires, and other things too. That would have made that whole process go much smoother. We've got eight of these assemblers now, and I think, I think we're going to need 12 to get all this automated. But we can get started by automating, for instance, analog circuits, which needs an assembler for the final product, but also an assembler for resistors, an assembler for uh, inductors, capacitors, and analog circuit boards. Um, but you see the problem now. Already we need to start thinking about to convert steam into electricity because that's what's going to feed our assemblers. So one of these things converts every millibucket of steam into one EU, up to 32 a tick. We can probably also craft up a large steam boiler as well to replace these ones. And the large steam boiler it uses fuel eight times faster, but it produces 256 millibuckets a tick, as opposed to 16 EU a tick. So this thing, eight of these will be giving us 128 EU a tick, or one steam boiler will you consume the same amount of, of coal and stuff, but will produce double the amount of steam. That sounds pretty cool. So give me 24 of them. A large steam boiler and nine heat proof machine casings. <laughs> These guys are driving me insane. Why won't you leave me alone? <laughs> Just leave me alone, guys. All their footsteps and the pitta patter. Oh, this cheeky machine. It looks like you can only replace the heatproof machine casings with the with the hatches. We're not going to be able to sneak it up top. Unlike its single block counterpart, in the large steam boiler, 80% of the unconsumed heat will be lost. This means the ratio for energy produced by fuel consumed will drastically decrease when the output decreases below maximum. This will happen when the boiler is not continuously at maximum output. Okay, so we'll just make the one for now then. Hatches must be placed at the bottom layer. Well, that's kind of a pain because it means it won't be able to share walls. Roll that up. Are you cooking? And we've got steam output. Okay. Now I know we can use granny sinks, but I like the idea of doing this all with just MI ingredients. So we're going to feed that lignite coal. We want a couple of these. LV steam turbines. So each one produces 32 EU a tick. So I think what we're going to do is, well, I'll make some first. I think the way we're going to do this is we 
can probably chuck one of them on the end there. Feed it the steam that it needs. Cool, that guy is now putting out power for us at 32 EU a tick. So let's put together the assemblers and stuff that we need here for the analog circuits. So we just go there, lock that recipe. This one can be the resistors. Lock everything else or otherwise random, random junk's gonna find its way in there. And finally, this one. Let's give it its items and see what happens. What a cable nightmare. <laughs> so everything should be good to be in and out now. It's coming in. In and out, in and out, with no filter, because remember we set we set what we want to limit coming in already inside here on the recipes, so we don't need to set the filters and the item pipes. And how's this on power? This recipe takes eight. We have eight, sixteen, twenty-four, thirty-two. We don't have enough power being produced here. I am going to just double the production. Okay, we now got 64 EU a tick being produced there. But just like that, now we've got this stuff available to the network, analog circuits, so we can tick it off. All right, let's keep going. And this one can make steel gears, which requires... <laughs> I knew it was too good to be true. This one's going to be receiving this stuff, the soldering alloy dust, which is mixture of tin and lead. And the problem is neither tin nor lead come from the, the bronze drill. So I've just been feeding them in manually here. Which are tin. No, sorry, tin, tin does, lead doesn't. So I just put all the lead that I had in here, and as you can see, it's already been consumed up. And that's been getting mixed up here to produce battery alloy dust, and as well as that, it's been mixed up here in a lead to make the soldering alloy. So we'll set that recipe there. Okay. It's a kind of a high tier machine, so it needed a steel input hatch or a steel hatch somewhere to upgrade the whole machine. That's now given us the soldering alloy. Fluid management is a little tricky. It would probably be easier just to set up a bunch of entangled tanks, these guys. So you just have one on the output and then one somewhere where it, where you need it, and they'll share an inventory. But I am trying to do an MI only factory. And besides, crazy pipes everywhere looks looks all right in my book. And this guy can make the basic machine hull. Oh my god! There it is. Everything on the list automated. Fun stuff, but I've had about enough of this factory and, and all the little pitter patter of these guys. Anyone has any suggestions with what to do with them, please let me know, because they are driving me insane. We still have a little bit that needs doing if we're going to automate the delivering of the drills back to the quarry. But in order to automate the, the making of these drills themselves, we would need to basically complete this line here. So an assembler for this, an assembler for that, five assemblers, six assemblers, and then just a cutting machine, a glass. We'll come back later and do that. But for now, I'm just, just going to have a quick trip to Y34 or so for some lead and antimony. And then we'll get over to Batania and use our newfound powers of automation. It's like entering a black and white world. <laughs> We've got color and then 1950s. Okay, so this setup here is kind of starting to show its age a little bit. It's looking a bit old. And to get mana from this thing, I've still had to like come out here from time to time, trigger this thing off to start dropping these charcoal blocks, come in here, feed it a bunch of tiny charcoal as well in order to in order to cook the stuff. Yeah, it's not pretty. And in addition to that, it's right here on our doorstep, not the best location. So I'm thinking we tear all this down and Kind of move it over into this open space over here, connect it to our ME system, and have a few of these things running automatically. And since we're starting again, why not let these things 
these endo flames take a bit of an early retirement. I think they've earned a bit of peace and quiet. And we'll get into using something a bit more fun. Now you can generate mana in a number of ways. We've been using the endo flames, which basically absorb anything combustible like charcoal or wood or whatever, and turn that into mana. You can also turn things like food into mana. Apparently feeding this thing cakes gives you a, a bucket load. You can feed the munch dew uh, leaves. So really handy to just kind of set this up next to your tree farm, walk away to set it and forget it. I didn't see this one before, but there's a thermo lily which uses, which absorbs lava. And we did just set up basically infinite lava source down in the, in the nether. So that, that would work. That'd be kind of fun. No, but instead I think what we'll use is entropinium. Is that entropinium? Entropinium, which eats up the blast of TNT converting that into mana. And to be honest, that sounds pretty fun. Maybe a little bit reckless, but fun nonetheless. Oh, um, before we do that, I set this thing up between episodes just to start accumulating the, the pigments for us. So that next time we're playing around with Spectrum, we'll have a healthy supply of, of pigments and logs to work with. It also duplicates saplings, which is nice. So you don't have to, you don't have to go crafting new ones every time. And that's just connected up to a bunch of the hopper botany pots with all the different colors in them. Pretty easy stuff. And then we should be able to turn that into one of these one of these floating entropiniums. <laughs> I just know I'm butchering the pronunciation on that. But that's not these regular flowers. Oh no, you need, you need to make it into these glowing variants, like so. I'm not sure what they do. They don't have an entry in the book. And then we can make islands with them. And then when they're entropiniums and whatever floating islands we have, we can make floating entropiniums. <laughs> and yeah, I don't think they make any difference. Oh yeah, so here's that little explosion chamber. TNT will get uh, deposited in there through an ME interface. It's going to set the recipe there. We'll do that in a minute. And then we'll have a series of redstone that'll trigger the dispenser to shoot out its goodies so long as there are mana pools that need it. And the distance for these entropiniums from an explosion is 12 blocks. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. So it'll definitely be able to eat up the explosion from over here. Let's put them there. And these point into mana spreaders. And I might actually just rewire this. Those mana spreaders will be attached to the mana splitter. And we can set up a comparator coming out of here. The splitter is going to make sure that these pools all have the same amount of mana in them uh, anyway. So it doesn't really matter which one we check. Let's see how far that takes us. So if this was full, it'd be putting out a 15 there. And that would take us to one zero. So inside the dropper here, we're going to have TNT delivered by an interface of a crafting card. And we'll worry about all that later. And attached to the dispenser is a little redstone um, tower, which is going to get a signal every 16, 32 ticks. I think, I think these redstone timers from Kibe do 32 ticks uh, when at max delay. You can do it much quicker, but I think max delay is not a bad idea when playing with fire. And let's just reset the whole system. So that would imply, since there's no signal coming through, that would imply that the mana pools are empty. And when it eventually reaches 15, that's when the system will know that the mana pools there are full. But at the moment it's empty, so the inverter turns a zero into a 15. That comes here into a comparator in subtraction mode. That's gonna get a pulse every 32 ticks. And if that mana pool is full, or if those mana pools are full, would have a signal, it'll invert that signal. And this line here is from another system, so let's pretend that one's full as well. Now, every time if they're both full, the signals get turned off and the pulse does nothing. But if either one of the mana systems that are connected here is turned off, doesn't matter which one, the pulse will still work. So these lines are like little request lines, like, hey, keep on depositing some TNT for us so we can eat them up. But as soon as they're full, we don't want explosions going off because not only is it a waste, but it'll damage, it'll damage these nearby blocks. All right, so find them. 
if I remember correctly, we just put Will on them to keep them quiet. And a couple of velocity lenses. We'll keep them going nice and fast. All right, let's test it out, I guess. We'll put all the TNT we have. At the moment, that's 44. We'll fire it up and see what happens. Explosions. These things consume the explosions. And then it's this one's turn. And it looks like they need to be completely empty. It looks like the entropiniums need to be completely empty in order to absorb the explosion. So that's why I like that 32 tick delay. All right, I think we're good. Hopefully this mana here can dissipate quick enough in order to basically never have a situation where there's not an entropinium <laughs> ready to absorb a blast. Right, and this thing has a little bit in it. It's pretty slow. I think to fill up a pool, if my calculations are correct, to fill up a pool requires two and a half stacks of explosives. And that's just one pool. We've got four here waiting. So we're going to have to have some auto-crafted TNT. So my thinking is we're going to be providing TNT here from a mixer, which is just gunpowder and sand. This is like, you get twice as much output this way than doing it the regular vanilla way. So four sand, five gunpowder equals two TNT. Same inputs here, just give you one. And gunpowder and sand, we're going to be producing both of those over at our MI factory. So they'll just be like a request slot here at the interface, just making sure that we're always topped up. And as you can see, they're all kind of evenly distributed. And we'll have an emergency switch at each of the stations to kind of just tell it to cool down, ease up on the explosions. Okay, I just threw together a little quick system here with recipes for all these mana pool wanting items. We used to do all that manually, and the whole point of this is we will do it automatically now. Now, I, I found the best system, at least the one that I can get working, is to have, like the pattern provider here says, hey, if you want some mana steel ingot, give me an iron ingot, and I'll know what to do with it. And in this case, it gives it to a, to a barrel, to an attached inventory. And then all it needs to do is get given it back to go back into the system. Uh, the ME system itself doesn't know how to make these items. It just knows where to send the items or where to send the ingredients in order to get the desired output. So in this case, it's going to export the, the iron, for instance, iron ingots into this barrel. These MD item pipes are great because you can change the maximum number of items that get sent. And I'm pretty sure it defaults to round robin. So by setting the number down to one, it's going to take turns delivering one iron ingot at a time and we'll get an even distribution of the mana in these pools being used up. That's why we really only have to check one pool to know how much mana is in all the rest of them. Do you know what I mean? Like when this one's full, they'll all be full. When this one's empty, they should all be empty. Now we just need to connect this to ME, and I think I might, I think I might just wire that one like so. Throw a P2P tunnel on there, set it to that frequency. As always, we'll store the memory card in there so we don't lose the frequencies. Now our system reckons it knows how to make mana pearls and, and mana ingots and all that stuff. But we're not done yet, unfortunately. We still need a way to get the items from the pools and put them back into the pattern provider to complete the, the cycle. And to do that, we've got this handy tool from Spectrum called a black hole chest, which is three blue pigment, polished calcite, and polished basalt. No? And a top up on some powder. Perhaps while we're waiting for that, we'll have a quick look at how we're going to get our hands on TNT. The gunpowder we can get from mixing up coke, easy, and sulfur. We are already getting sulfur from macerating up lignite, so hopefully we've got no shortage of that. And the sand you can get this kind of funny way where you macerate gravel to get sand. Gravel itself comes from a steam quarry with a copper drill, which is very easy to make. Let's go collect our black hole chest. We can just put this there, I suppose. Saying let anything out of it and anything back into the pattern provider. <laughs> Not gonna lie, that noise kind of startled me. And you can set filters up here. Oh, doesn't seem to be good with REI. Now I believe if we say, hey, let's give us 12 mana steel ingots. Let's see if this works all right.
Yes, job done. So that's mana production taken care of, and then more endo flames. I want to put down our agglomeration table somewhere to make more terra steel. And I'm thinking, well, we've got to be careful not to be within the vicinity of our black hole chest there. Like, because you need to chuck down things like mana steel, they would just get sucked up by our, our black hole chest. So it looks like that's the border right there. Yeah. I think that was these five. These four and that. And then you just put sparks on those pools and on top of there. One more thing to do to get us back to where we were, and that is to automate our living rock and our living logs. You'll recall this works just by kind of surrounding a pure daisy with wood logs or with stone. And it is a little tricky, but I did find a way to get it done. Oh, also going to want to read a signal out of here to see when these pools are full. All right, just quickly, both these lines now, both these lines now from the from the mana setup and from our agglomeration one have <laughs> um, they kind of join here to form a little AND gate. So basically, they just share the same line now. So remember, redstone power means the thing's full. If it's not full, one of them turns on, which sends that signal out. If it is full, it's inverted, you're all good. There's probably a simpler way to do the redstone, but, but I'm no redstone expert. This will have to do. So that's that set up. Now we want to do stone and wood conversion. And we're going to try and do it with the ingredients you see here. Controller, ME interface, some formation and annihilation planes, a couple of import buses, a storage. These things called ME level emitters, and then just some cables. I marked something up in creative. I'm just hopeful that I can remember it. So you go there. We have the level emitters on either side. We're going to have import buses on either side of this interface. And the interface is going to be providing stone and oak logs. And the level emitters are going to tell the system to stop when we have, let's just say, a stack of a particular item. So emit a signal when levels are below 64 living wood logs. And this one will emit a signal when levels are below 64 living rock. Which it's doing. And we're going to have a controller sitting here on top with 32 channels going to one face of it, which are going to come from the side CS9. So one, two. Now, it may not be the prettiest thing. I'm off two minds whether or not we should be having the controller display in there, but I think it looks kind of cool. So it doesn't matter really which way you put down these planes, but let's say we annihilate from the bottom. And we form from the top. And these formation planes, let's give them, let's set these ones as the oak. And then when I mirror it, we'll, on the other side, we'll set the other eight, which I have to make now, as stone. We connect up these import buses here to our controller. And the important thing to note is that this controller here is on a separate network to everything else. You can't have it on the same network. And that's what our little quartz fiber there is doing. It's just transporting through power, but not any kind of system connections. Okay, it's got its reserves. Oh, clearly I have this backwards. We want to emit, emit when levels are above or equal to the limit. And these can output stone for us. So in case you didn't know, formation planes and annihilation planes are kind of like the opposite. Formation planes can put things into the world, or if you want, it can drop items into the world by toggling this thing here. And annihilation planes, which we've already been playing with, they'll destroy blocks. Whoops. <laughs> okay, I just had to set the filters on the storage bus there. 
Now these aren't going to do anything until we plant ourselves these daisies. Sparkles means it's doing its magic. And these annihilation planes on the bottom, like they'll destroy anything you put on top of it. But because there's nowhere to store it, because our storage filter here says only destroy these two things, it's just waiting to destroy a block that it's able to store. Hope that makes sense. Mm hmm Keep an eye on that level emitter. Now it turns on. So what happened then? Oh, I forgot a step. Redstone card. These import buses here have to have a redstone card telling it to abide by redstone logic. Active without signal. That's the one. New, same deal. Redstone card active without signal. Right. Yeah, the reason why I like this kind of setup so much is we can just set a number here in the level emitter and then we'll always have that amount or more, in this case more, of the things we want in storage. If we consume them, this will just turn back on and make them again. I like that. I think it's really nifty. And I believe if we're a little bit tricky, we should be able to set up an oak farm here as well to slowly produce oak for us. And since it'll be a forever thing, we will probably try and be a little sensible and, and store it in a big dank. These botany pots can be a little jank and cause a huge amount of lag if you don't empty what builds up in them. But if we just output things straight into an interface, then it'll just go into one of these slots down here and disappear back into our system. All right, everything here seems to be working in order, except we haven't got the TNT coming in yet. Let's go check out how our factory is going and hook up things that are needed for us to automate drills and TNT. All right. Ooh, nice healthy supply there. We've got our machine hulls. Nice. I think we got a decent amount of all the basic stuff. That's cool. So what we wanted to do is automate these three things up here. TNT, as we said, pretty easy. We mix gunpowder and sand. And sand we get by macerating gravel. And gravel we're going to get from the copper drill. So, maybe let's look at doing these drills first. To assemble a bronze drill, you need bronze drill heads, also assembled. And we've got everything there except for the bronze gears. All this stuff's going to require soldering alloy, that's good to know. Item pipes and fluid pipes. Topper gears, and I think we have everything else. So what's that, like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten more assemblers. Seven, eight, nine, ten. And I might just put in the same place here, everything that requires soldering alloy. That's much neater. Now all these things that require soldering alloy can just get it straight from the source. Atom pipes and fluid pipes, and that should be our drills for copper, and our drills of bronze. Now let's make a rule that fluids come in from the top. That way we can we can reserve the space here for power and items and things. And now's the fun part where we get to use a fine tooth comb and let everything in <laughs> and let them all out as well. I always forget that. Cool, there we go. Bronze drills. Ooh, copper drills. Come on, little buddy, you can do it. That's it, I believe in you. Ah, there we go. Copper drills coming in. So good. Now we have them coming in here automatically, automatically filling the quarries, and they'll keep on ticking over. Now this hurts me, but I think, think what that means is it's going to be better for us to take this dock back and install it at the other side so that the, the drops from the copper drill have some kind of bulk storage to go to. On the back, we're going to connect it to our MI system, and then underneath, we're going to connect it to our ME system. So this inventory is full. Let anything in that can fit, come on in and actually share it as well. Now these things should all be finding their way out of here slowly. Hopefully there's enough of a buffer there and getting put into here. Yeah, we can see the cobblestone there's going higher and higher. Screw it. Let's also just set up our drops so we can share these things. I'm looking at gunpowder in particular. I might not keep these things here long term, but at least for now it'll do. So we want to macerate you and we want to mix 
U. And then we want to mix them into TNT. And sand. But until we have configurable chest set up, I'm just going to have a little barrel here with a filter for TNT. And make that available to ME. All right, let's go get that TNT input set up and then we'll have mana automated in the interface. Oh, don't tell me. <laughs> the interface can't output. That's really unfortunate, but in that case, let's use the export bus instead and swap this one out. And then export TNT. All right, that seems to be working. Let's hope we don't blow up the base. Oh, terrible angle. All right, so take home message. Definitely store up more of those little MI parts than you think you're gonna need. In hindsight, I probably should have thrown down a few MI barrels for like high number items, like copper and tin wires, rubber, steel plates, that kind of stuff too. And just let that accumulate so that would have Heaps of ingredients to make assemblers. But anyway, unfortunately we're out of time again, although this episode's gone a little bit over. Next time, well, we've got everything we need to set up the Alfheim portal in Britannia and start trading with some elves. <laughs> Not kidding. That's what the book says. And if that wasn't enough, I think we could probably do with a little vacation. I hear the moon's great this time of year. Just a couple bags today, nothing too exciting. Yeah. One day we'll get something cool from there, I swear. All right, hope you enjoyed the episode and that my MI and Batania walkthroughs were helpful. Thanks so much for watching. Until next time, 